Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. It's flavorful, it's aromatic, it has a number of health benefits, and as it turns out, it's pretty easy to grow. What is it, you ask? It's garlic. And if the supermarket is the only place you've encountered garlic, you might not realize how many different sizes, shapes, and flavors there are. Today, we're gonna to talk about everything you need to know to grow your own garlic, from how and when to plant to the varieties that work well in our area. And Mr. D is here with tips on winterizing your tools. All that and more is just ahead of the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plots. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Carl Wayne Hardeman. Carl Wayne is a master gardener right here in Shelby County. And Mr. D is here. Thanks for joining me. Glad Thank you. Here. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. All right, well Mr. Carl, let's talk about garlic. We haven't done that yet on the show, so what is garlic? Oh, garlic, that's great. Well, uh, you know, the Latin word is, uh, or term is, uh, 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 allium sativa. Okay. okay? <laughs> but it's, it's in the allium family. Uh, which there's uh, a lot of different garlics, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, plants. There's leeks and chives and mm -hmm. shallots and uh, a, a bunch of lesser known ones. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an old primary vegetable. It was the vegetable okay. of the Mongol hordes and the Attila the Hun and the Egyptians <laughs> that okay. built the, the pyramids. And, uh, you know, they didn't have potatoes and tomatoes uh, that came from the New World. Okay. So they ate garlic. Okay. And uh, did they like the garlic? I wonder. Well, I don't know if they had a, uh, <laughs> had a, a choice. choice, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of the garlic? Yeah, uh, the garlic uh, origin originated on the, in Asia. Okay. Okay, which is cold, dry, uh, sandy, rocky soil. Hmm. Somewhere probably on the eastern shore of the, of the Black Sea. Hmm. Uh, which is where scientists also believe that we, we used to all speak one language that's called the Proto-Indo-European language <laughs> that originated there and all of, uh, from there west, we all speak uh, variations of uh, that. So the garlic spread with the people that hmm. spread out all over uh, the world. Okay, so how many different varieties of garlic are available? Okay, great, uh, great question. You know. Uh, if, you, if you go online, you can find <laughs> 200 varieties, okay? okay? But, you know, put a little science in it. Uh, the um, uh, scientists have done the DNA, and there's actually only 10 uh, DNA-specific uh, hmm. uh, types of, of garlic. And, uh, uh, but it responds to the soil conditions, the weather, the amount of sunlight, and so the degree of pungency, the mm -hmm. color, the days to maturity, and all varies so much that people say, oh, I've got a brand new garlic here, when in fact it was really just a variation caused by the environment. Okay. And you move that it somewhere sense. else and you don't get the same results. But uh, I have a list okay. here that all I right. thought I would uh, tell you. There's uh, the 10 distinct varieties, five are a hard neck. That means they have a stiff neck. Uh, they're called porcelains, purple stripe, marbled purple stripe, and rocambo. And then there's the soft necks, which is mainly grown in the south. Okay. Creole, Asiatic, turban, artichoke, and silver skin. And uh, don't you just love ones like rojo ojo, <laughs> red, ho, red yeah. eye. Yeah, I mean, red I, eye. I, I love it. But that, that's really the 10. Okay. The distinct ones. Okay. Creole sounds like Louisiana, maybe? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, I'm a... I'm a uh, another 50 miles south where I lived in Louisiana, I'd have been a fish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from there. Okay. Well, well tell us, this, when is the best time to plant garlic here in the Mid-South? Okay, great question. You know, 
Uh, Miss Juanita Fant was a mm. longtime master gardener mm -hmm. and well respected. Uh, she used to say, you plant all your spring bulbs on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Mm. So uh, pretty much I do that. Okay. So the Saturday after Thanksgiving is kind of like before the first killing frost. Uh, so the, the, the plants, uh, the, the uh, onions t t too, I do the onions and I plant them then. And they start growing roots all winter. Okay. Okay. But they may not necessarily grow a top, which a killing frost could, could get. Okay, now, I right. put uh, row covers uh, over mine. Okay. But you want your, your plants that will survive, uh, and including carrots and so forth. You want them to grow a big, healthy uh, root system during sure. the winter. And then uh, next spring, it comes time to form the, the root or the, the uh, um, as in carrots or the bulb. Uh, and onions and, and so forth. Well, you you want them to have the, the base to start doing that. Okay. So tell us this, how do you plant them? Okay. Um, Best method. Yeah, uh, garlic really prefers, uh, as a lot of plants do, but it, it likes a loose, rich <laughs> soil with, uh, which we have at the Victory Garden. We yes, probably have yeah. nearly a foot thick. It looks like coffee grounds. Yeah. You know, uh, so you want this loose, uh, rich with organic material, and then what you do is uh, what at the volunteer garden. I'm um, excuse me at the victory garden. What we do is get a bunch of ladies and children who can bend over, you know, <laughs> and uh, we'll drop the, where we want the cloves, and they'll they'll plant them. But uh, it basically make a hole with uh, anything, you know, like a broom or a hoe. Make a hole uh, two and two to three inches deep, and then you drop the individual. Uh, the individual cloves in it. Okay. And the cloves, cloves have a okay. distinct pointy end, you know, and a distinct flat end. So okay. you plant them pointy end up. Okay. <laughs> Not sure that matters because you've always heard that about potatoes, but it doesn't matter. You know, always plant them eye up, but it really doesn't matter. Okay. You know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's what we do. Okay. And you always plant the large uh, cloves. The number one predictor of size of garlic bulb is the size of the clove, clove. that okay. you planted. I didn't know that. And right. then it, it, it does not abide clay, <laughs> and it does not abide weeds. Okay, <laughs> weeds. And, okay. and so uh, you, you either plant in, in uh, uh, one of those fabrics, you know, okay. the uh, landscape, the landscape fabrics, right. or you know, get your exercise in the spring, pulling out the yeah the the weeds because they don't they don't like weeds. Okay, so we have them planted now. When do we harvest them? Okay, uh, that's a little tougher. Okay, now, oh, it's tough. Uh, we we grow uh, well, actually, almost by far, uh, all of the garden a uh, garlic grown in the United States is a, a soft neck. Actually, it's uh, a California early. Um, grown in Gilroy, California, where roughly 90% of the garlic in the United States is grown. Wow. If you go to the grocery store, that's what you're going to get, right. okay? Well, uh, that, that soft neck, uh, uh, it grows like an onion. So when the leaves fall over, it's ready. ready. Okay. okay, that's pretty simple. And that's what grows well here. Now, in the, in the Victory Garden, we grow a lot of, uh, of the uh, hard neck varieties. And then you kind of have to watch them. Okay. When you get, when two of the leaves start turning brown, that's the time to dig them. And that happens, uh, depending on the varieties you have, they have different mm. maturity dates. So that, that's kind of what you're up against. All right, so we talked about planting garlic. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the varieties that grow well in this area? Okay, well, um, the, the soft neck grow better, the hard neck do better in cold climates. Uh, we started out with 23 varieties and kind of, kind of culled down to uh, eight varieties that uh, we like. Uh, uh, elephant garlic, which is really a leek, not a, not a garlic, uh, does extremely well. And then I like Kettle River. Uh, I also like uh, Chesnock, uh, Georgia Crystal, and a Romanian Red. And then uh, Ojo Rojo, and that one just to brag about it at the Master Gardener Christmas party. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, those, those are the ones that do the best here. Although I'll, I'll have several more varieties. It's all experiment, right? Gardens all about experiment. Yeah. And bragging to the other gardeners. That's good. Yeah, because these are demonstration gardens, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Mr. Carr, we appreciate the information about garlic. Oh, I love it. 
right. Just think all this time I thought garlic was for repelling vampires. Yeah. <laughs> so it worked. It worked. We, we, have, we haven't had a one since we started planting that victory garden. We're good. Uh, we appreciate the information. We have some suspects, but we're no con confirmation. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, winter is coming. So let's talk about winterizing our tools. What do we need to know? You know, I'm a firm believer in if you take care of your equipment, mm -hmm. it'll take care of you. And that doesn't make any difference what line of work you're in, whether you're a hunter or a fisherman or a gardener. Right. And uh, I firmly believe, I, I mean, I've got some tools that, that are probably 30 or 40 years old or, or older that, that I've still use and the reason I can still use them is because I take care of them and uh, you know one of the main things that you can do with with a hand tool is make sure that you go into the winter you, you have them clean unlike the <laughs> shovel that we've got back here you have them clean and and you you've coat them with a thin coat of oil uh, my dad always had a, a five gallon bucket with burnt cylinder oil in it oh. and he would just lean up the post hole diggers and the shovels and and that's where they're still stored right wow. now uh, they're still leaning in that five gallon bucket of burnt cylinder oil <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to immerse them in oil but if you cover them with a thin uh, you know take an oily rag and just rub it real good over right. the metal parts uh, that will go a long way in protecting them sharpen them if you know I would do I would sharpen them before I do that and I, I'd even you know, uh, run a file over yeah. the, the end of shovels and things like that to make sure that you don't have any burrs there and then put that thin coat of oil on them. If you have wooden handles, uh, boiled linseed oil is a very, very good treatment. I would probably lightly sand those handles, run some fine grit sandpaper over them to make sure you don't have any splinters or, or burrs or anything like that that might, you know, yeah. cause you a blister and then take you a rag that that uh, you've soaked in boiled linseed oil and rub that up and down that handle and, and you're pretty much good to go with your, with your hand tools. With your uh, engines, your small engines, uh, go into the winter, uh, four stroke engines, I'd change the oil, you know, you know store, store them with, with good fresh oil in them. I would uh, clean uh, air filters, mm -hmm. uh, clean uh, 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 fuel filters, you know, fuel filters are something that, that are often overlooked and, yeah. and there's a way to clean or replace them. Uh, I would either drain the fuel from them or make sure that I, if I want to leave fuel in them, if you're going to be using them, make sure that you store them full with a stabilizer in, in, in the fuel. And I would recommend using a non-ethanol fuel in mm -hmm. all small engines. Not ethanol. Um, most okay. of the small engines uh, don't, especially if it's an older small engine. Okay. It's not uh, designed to run, you know, ethanol can be uh, a problem with, with some of these small engines. And so find you a source for non-ethanol fuel. If you're a fisherman, you know where that is <laughs> because you want to run non-ethanol fuel in your boat motor. Uh, but uh, that pretty much covers the small engines. Now, uh, one other thing that most gardeners have to use from time to time is a sprayer. Yeah. Don't forget about yeah. your sprayer and, and just leave it with the last thing that you sprayed it with <laughs> all, all right. winter long. Yeah. Yeah. You know, clean, wash that sprayer out. Make sure you uh, use a cleaner. Ammonia is a, is a good cleaner or a det any detergent. Uh, uh, you know, drain it, hang it upside down so that it'll drain. And then pay special attention to the nozzles. Take the mm -hmm. nozzles off. And, and uh, you know, soak them in a soapy solution and make sure you've got them clean. Your screens, a lot of times, yeah. there's, most of the time, there should be a screen uh, between the nozzle and the hose and, and make sure you clean those. And, uh, you know, then you right. should be good to go next year. Yeah. So uh, triple rinse? Triple those, rinse, uh, I would sprayers. always triple rinse, you know, uh, uh, triple rinse your, your sprayer. You know, every yeah. time, anytime you're changing products, and yeah. and pretty much the wand and all that stuff too, right? Yeah, you know, put water in it, and you know, I what I do is I fill it with water, 
rinse it a couple of times, and then I will put my soapy solution in it, pump it up, you know, oh, run okay. that soapy solution through the mm -hmm. through the the nozzles and everything, and then and then pour that out, put water, and then go. I rinse two or three times with water, to, you know, clean that out too. Um, but uh, uh, you do need to take that nozzle apart, take it out, and, and make sure you you got it clean because you can do all of that, yeah. and if you don't take it apart and check the screen, and you may still have some problems next year when you try to when you try to go back. Okay. What about folks that uh, use like chainsaws or those you know those chain loppers? Mm -hmm. how, how to go about? Same um, thing, same but thing. you know I, I treat them like I treat my hand tools. Okay. My pruning shears, my hand shears, uh, I will sharpen them. You know, of course, I'm going to use them pretty soon. You know, in in the late yeah. winter, I'm going to use them. But but and before, either now or before I, I break them out and start using them in late winter, uh, I will will make sure I've got them coated with oil mm -hmm. and I will sharpen them. And and uh, you know, I my sharpen my my hand pruners on a knife sharpener. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't use a, a grinder or, or a, even a file. Is a little okay. much for my for my hand shears, but your your loppers, your your long, uh, you know, if you have a, a long loppers, you do the same thing yeah. with them. You can you can touch them up, coat them with oil, and you know I consider them just a hand tool and treat them the same way that you would your, you know, your wooden handled hand tool. Okay. You don't have to <laughs> coat that uh, fiberglass or that plastic handle with linseed oil, but uh, you know. The metal working parts you need to treat just like you know you need to cut, make sure you oil them and sharpen them and clean them up and get them ready for winter. Can you use another type of oil just in case you don't have the linseed oil? Well, you mean for the wooden handle? Yeah, for the wooden handle. For the wooden yeah. handle, uh, you know, boil linseed oil is is uh, is what uh, I've seen recommended. I'm sure okay. there, I'm sure any oil okay. would probably help. Uh, I know boil linseed oil is an old preservative that we've used for years and years uh, on on. Trailer beds and things like that. We that's one of the things that you used to treat before we used creosote even. Oh wow! You would, okay. you, and, you, and it doesn't last as long. I mean, you've got to redo it. Uh -huh. But but it's a preservative and and it, it just really works well and it's not ex expensive and and I've got two cans of it that are probably one quart cans. And the only reason I have two is because I couldn't find <laughs> my first can, so I went out and bought another one. They're not expensive at, at all, but. In the absence of linseed oil, probably any oil, any would, oil. would would help. You know, preservative is what you're trying to trying to you know get done, and any oil would probably do okay. Take care of your tools; they take care of you. Take care of your yeah, tools; they'll take care of you. My grandpa used to say that, so it makes sense. And your grandpa was right. All right. Well, here's our Q and A session, and Mr. Carl, I want you to jump in there with us. All right. Here's our first email and a photo from Bill. And he writes, how do I get rid of black mold and what causes it? And it's there on the screen. So, Mr. D, how do I get rid of black mold and uh, what causes that? Probably the best way to get rid of it is to uh, get rid of what caused it. That's right. <laughs> and that's probably sooty mold, probably sooty which mold. is a, a fungus that grows on honeydew mm -hmm. that's secreted by either aphids or scale insects or some Mealy other bugs. critter. bugs. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but as far as getting rid of the black mold itself, you know, a hose-in sprayer with detergent in it, and you can, you can, you can wash it off. Mm -hmm. But you need to, that's, that's taking care of a symptom of a problem. Right. You need to uh, go and, and make sure that, that you take care of that problem that's, that initially released that honeydew. And it may already be gone. Right. That problem may already be gone. I mean, aphids are a classic example of an insect that normally when the population builds to a certain level, then either predators or a disease will many, many times mm -hmm. take it out. And so, but they've already secreted the honeydew. You may already have the city mold growing. Just a hose-in sprayer with a, with a blast of water or if it's a small plant, toothbrush and, you know, yeah, small if you don't have anything yeah. else to do. You know, Warm, you know. soapy water, yeah, little rag, toothbrush. Yeah, yeah, just, right. just, just get it out there. And uh, yeah, but you have to control the aphids or scales or mealybugs mm -hmm. and you can do that insecticidal soap, neem oil, you know, something safe, green products. Mm -hmm. And uh, that should take care of it. In yep. my opinion. Yep. All right, Mr. Bill, there you have it. Uh, here's our next question. Can you ask Mr. D if we can successfully grow apples here in Shelby County? I would like to give it a shot if he thinks it's doable. So is it doable, Mr. D? It is. It is. Yes, we can grow a lot of apples here. Apples, you know, traditional apple growing areas normally are higher elevations uh, many times and 
and but we can grow them fine here. They they do well. We've had commercial apple orchards in West Tennessee okay. for for years and years and years, and and they do really well. And flipping, yeah, flipping up in and my uncle had I had uh, an uncle in Dyer County that had a successful apple orchard, uh, Noel Carmen, for for a lot of years, and and uh, mm -hmm. then a, another another neighbor. Uh, I uh, actually had two uncles. Uh, Ferris Garner had one, an apple orchard south of Newburn, and and uh, and uh, then uh, the play, uh, Porters, uh, Nathan Porter, had an apple orchard up there. They were they were just scattered so around all over the place. Okay. So they do well. Um, you you need to make sure that you use pollinators. Apples, yeah. most apples require cross pollination, and and if you go to the UT's website, there are uh, <laughs> probably as many varieties out of apples as there are <laughs> garlics out there. We, they do have some that are more disease resistant than others and I can go down that list if you want me to. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you need uh, to get a chainsaw and go cut down all the cedar trees uh, anywhere near <laughs> you? Cedar apple rust? That's a, that's, a, that's a problem you're going to have. Cedar you know, you rust. can't, I doubt that you have a good enough chainsaw that you can cut down enough uh, cedar trees around because if they're within a, uh, you know, a mile or two miles and the prevailing wind, you know, blows yeah. the cedar apple out. It's, it's a really interesting disease. Uh, you know, it spends part of its life cycle on cedar trees and part of it on apple trees. It'll have a bright uh, kind of a yeah. spot, <laughs> orange spot on, on the apple leaves. It'll turn black and, and, and then uh, at, uh, there's kind of a purple looking uh, inch and a half in diameter to two inch diameter ball hanging on a cedar tree that many people think are cedar fruit. <laughs> it's not cedar fruit. And at one, just a very brief time period, it erupts into a beautiful volunteer orange, yeah, it's orange color no doubt. and releases spores <laughs> no and doubt. the wind blows it to apple trees and it, and it creates problems. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you follow a, a home orchard, you know, spray schedule on the apples, uh, it'll take care of that yeah. disease along with other worse diseases that apples get, so some of the rots yeah. that, that they okay. get. You can grow apples without spraying them. Okay. You'll have rots and fly speck and things like that. You'll have, you'll have problems, but you can still eat the apple. I right. mean, they'll, they'll look like yeah, apples. When you and I were growing up, we thought apples were supposed to look. We didn't realize that a yellow delicious apple, if it's diseases and insects are controlled on it, it's just really yellow without any blemishes on it. I thought all yellow delicious apples had little blemishes. specks on it and, and little, you know, black, you know, dark discolorations and things like that, which is, which are, are some of the fungal diseases. So but yes, some, you can grow yeah, apples. So here. what are some of the, the varieties uh, that you can grow? And I, I'm going to mention some of the okay. ones that, uh, you know, Molly's Delicious, Gala, Honey Crisp. Yeah, okay. These are Jonathan Delicious. Yeah. Some, these are some of the old standbys, and they're not disease resistant. Okay. But Golden Delicious is a very good pollinator. Uh, uh, wine sap, Arome, Arkansas Black, Fuji, yeah. Braeburns that will work here, Granny Smith, Pink Lady, those are some that are not disease resistant. You know, those you need to pay more attention to some of the diseases. Disease resistant varieties I'm not as familiar with, but Liberty, Red Tree, Prima, Freedom, Priscilla, Gold Rush, and Enterprise or examples of some disease-resistant varieties that you might want to try here. We used to have, uh, I don't know, we called them May apples, and I know it's not the same as a plant, but uh, they were kind of a custard. Yeah, and we had they June were, apples, too. Yeah, June yeah. apples, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah they were sour. I mean, we didn't have candy back in those days, so yeah. that's... Uh, <laughs> a little bit more yeah. sour. <laughs> yeah. Made good apple pies. Oh, yeah. Good apple pie. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure which one of those that is, but it's probably one of these that I listed here. Uh, so but I'm, there's not one called a June yeah, apple, or apple, May apple, apple yeah. <laughs> but but it's one of these that that will ripen a little bit earlier. Yeah, than well, good deal. Yes, we can grow them here. Okay. If you grow a red delicious here, because of the lower elevation, it'll be a round apple. Okay. The further, and this is just an interesting little side bit. The higher the elevation is, the more prominent the lobes are on the delicious apple. Okay. If it, so if it has long lobes, you know the little five lobes on the end of the apple you know that it you know grew in a higher elevated right. area. And they respond well to uh, espalier. Okay. You know, yeah, and, I mean, and, and, it, and it, that helps with one of the main problems, which is, uh, you know, you go out there one day and you've got several hundred apples to do something with before they rot on the ground, you know, so, you know. Okay. You get them all at once, right? Get them all at once, that'd be good.
All right, Mr. Carl, Mr. D, we're out of time. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wknl.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. We're down to our last two episodes before we go dormant for the winter months. So get those letters and emails to us as soon as possible. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.